Thank you. You may be seated. God bless you. It's so good today to be together with brethren of like precious faith and to rejoice in the knowledge of God our Savior. I'd like to take a moment here today to express my appreciation to Brother Urshan and to Brother Jones and to Brother Haney and Brother Williams and to the executive board of the United Pentecostal Church for the invitation to speak here on the subject of the humanity of Jesus Christ, the greatest miracle ever to occur, the Incarnation. God manifest in genuine, authentic, and complete humanity. I also would like to say to many people who have stopped me in the halls and elsewhere to say they were praying for me that I deeply appreciate that. And I do acknowledge my need of God's help. And I pray that the Lord would help me today to speak the truth in love and to speak with humility. There is a fine line to be drawn between gratitude for what God has shown us from his word and the possibility of arrogance because we understand some things more clearly than others. I believe that all of our theology must be done with humility because we are fallible people and because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So I want to be humble and I pray that God would help me with that today. A hallmark of Oneness Pentecostalism is that we have always believed in and fervently declared the deity of Jesus Christ. We believe with Isaiah that Jesus is the mighty God and the everlasting Father, Isaiah 9-6. In fact, in keeping with the Hebrew theology of name that is so richly found in both the Old and New Testaments, we understand that when Isaiah said his name shall be called, among other things, the mighty God and the everlasting Father, that that means more than just this is an appellation. But it means that he really is the mighty God and the everlasting Father. We agree with the newly convinced Thomas when he knelt before Jesus as recorded in John 20 and 28 and said that he was both Lord and God. We do not agree with those who believe that uh, Thomas was merely uttering an expletive here of being shocked at seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead. We read John to be saying in John 20 and verse 28 that Thomas said to him, to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And we understand that Thomas being a devout Jew and uh, very much monotheistic in his theology meant when he said that, that Jesus was both his Yahweh or Jehovah and his Elohim. We believe with Paul in Romans 9, 5 that Jesus is the eternally blessed God. And also we agree with him from Colossians 2, 9 that Jesus has all of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him bodily. And that means that everything that makes God God resides bodily in the person of Jesus Christ. We agree with Paul in 1 Timothy 3.16, a scripture that we'll return to later, that Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. We are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us according to Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. We join with the writer of the 45th Psalm and of the book of Hebrews who quoted that psalm in saying of Christ, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Like those to whom Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, we have obtained like precious faith with by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we join with John in saying of Jesus Christ in 1 John 5.20, this is the true God and eternal life. We have always been known, and I pray that we will always be known as people who believe in and fervently declare that Jesus Christ is God himself. On the other hand, we also declare that in the mystery of the incarnation, 
this great God made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross Philippians chapter 2 verses 7 and 8 the first article of faith of the United Pentecostal Church declares that there is one God who manifest himself in the Son the second article of faith declares that the Son is both God and man and it reads and I quote Jesus in his humanity was man in his deity was and is God Jesus on his father's side was divine on his mother's side human thus he was known as the son of God and also the son of man or the God man in quote from our articles of faith we must never compromise the deity of Christ and we must never compromise the humanity of Christ if we do either I fear that we are preaching another Jesus whom Paul did not preach and as a consequence we will be in danger of preaching as he said in the same verse another gospel and receiving another spirit second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4 to preach the Jesus of the Bible is to proclaim the true gospel and it is to receive the Holy Spirit that was promised by God through Joel and other Old Testament prophets and as was fulfilled beginning on the day of Pentecost heresy has been described by someone as truth out of balance that's not original with me or any of us but I do believe that's true to a large degree we must maintain the biblical balance concerning the identity of Jesus Christ he is at once fully God and fully man one of the my favorite sections of the articles of faith of the United Pentecostal Church is the preamble I'm really happy that our preamble reads the way it does before anything else is said it makes me feel very good about what follows let me read to you just a few lines from the preamble of the Articles of Faith of the United Pentecostal Church. The first line, we believe the Bible to be inspired of God, the infallible Word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. The second paragraph of the preamble reads thusly the Bible is the only God-given authority which man possesses therefore all doctrine faith hope and all instruction for the church must be based upon and harmonize with the Bible the United Pentecostal Church at its formation in 1945 decided to include in the preamble of the articles of faith a rejection an implicit rejection of any idea of extra biblical revelation we believe that God has given us what we need to know in this book right here we believe that he speaks to us through this book that this book is actually inspired of God that every word in it comes to us by means of that inspiration now here today I suppose that the information that we're going to be discussing from the scripture could be examined could be organized in many ways I know it could I know that many other texts other than those we'll be able to look at could be examined but what I've chosen to do here today is to examine the humanity of Christ by organizing relevant scriptural text into three categories the first category is the category of direct statements of scripture that proclaim the humanity of Jesus Christ the second category is the category of messianic prophecies now of course these are direct statements too but because they are prophetic statements we're going to be looking at them separately and the third category is the category of what I would call deductions in other words by reading relevant text of scripture and comparing them we come to conclusions that we believe are biblically sound I know that we've all heard of preachers who preach from Genesis to Revelation but with whatever apologies may be due today I'm going to tell you that's exactly what I'm going to do because the genuineness of Christ's humanity is found in the very first book of the Bible the book of Genesis and it continues all the way through to the last book of the Bible the book of Revelation and indeed the last book or the last chapter of that last book of the Bible Revelation chapter 22 
So first we're going to look today at these direct statements of Scripture. I found it very interesting that not only does the first book of the Bible declare the genuineness of Christ's humanity, but the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, not only declares it, but the, the book begins in its very first chapter and first verse with a declaration of the genuineness of Christ's humanity. And then that continues right on through, through the book of Revelation. Now let me say, maybe by way of definition before I go any further, although I will be saying this a number of times, that when I say that Christ's humanity is genuine, I mean that he stands in solidarity with us. I mean that he is, as well as being God in this miracle of the incarnation, he is also a human being. And when I say a human being, I mean a human being who is descended from Adam. And who is descended stands in the line in continuity with every human being who has ever lived. I mean a human being who received his personal human existence from his mother Mary, the virgin girl who was chosen by God and who found favor with God and who conceived in her womb and who gave birth to our Savior Jesus Christ. Now that's what I mean by humanity. I need to define that term, I believe. But let's begin by looking today in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. This verse reads, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The word that is translated generation here is a Greek word that is related, in fact, to the word Genesis, as in the very first book of our Bible. This word generation is a word that means the origin or the source are the productive cause. In other words, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 declares that the origin and the source of the humanity of Jesus Christ is none other than David and Abraham. He is the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now Matthew, a Jew, writing to a Jewish audience, takes the lineage only back so far as Abraham. Because as far as his Jewish audience was concerned, that was all that was really significant. If he was descended from Abraham, that was far enough to go. But when you read the book of Luke, Luke, of course, is a Gentile, writing to a Gentile audience. And when you read the book of Luke, you'll notice that Luke takes the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam and points out that he descended ultimately from Adam himself. Matthew chapter 1, the same chapter, go down to verse 16. It reads, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. We have some key words here in this verse. Notice, first of all, the words of whom. The Greek words translated of whom means from whom or out of whom. And the relative pronoun whom is translated from the Greek feminine singular relative pronoun. In other words, it's very careful here how the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew. Jesus was not born of Joseph. He was not begotten by Joseph, but he was born of Mary. Notice it again. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, in other words, of Mary, grammatically, was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The word translated bo uh, born, the Greek word ganao, which again is related to that Genesis idea, means to engender, and it indicates the biological connection between Mary and Jesus, making Jesus truly human. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus. The angel said to Mary, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Mary could not conceive unless she supplied the egg, the ovum. This conception did not happen outside of her womb or even in her womb but without any contribution from her. If Mary did not provide the egg, she did not conceive. The angel said, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. In the next verse, Luke chapter 1 verse 32, the angel also said, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, which means the Son of God. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. David was Jesus' father or ancestor. Unless Jesus descended physically from David, he would not be qualified to sit on the throne of David. Jesus was the fulfillment 
of God's promise to David that he would set one on his throne who was the fruit of David's body. Psalm 132 verse 11. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 36, the angel said to Mary, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren notice the angel says that elizabeth also conceived if elizabeth conceived so did mary both women provided the egg for the conception luke chapter 1 verse 41 reads and it shall come and it came to pass now watch this very carefully that when elizabeth heard the salutation of mary the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost and she spake out with a loud voice and said now please notice that what she is saying is by the influence of the Holy Spirit with which she has just been filled and Elizabeth says to Mary blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me these were not just speculations that Elizabeth was making she was speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and she identified Jesus as the fruit of Mary's womb and as the mother of her Lord. Luke chapter 2 verse 21 reads, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb. He was not created outside of her womb and implanted into her womb. She was no surrogate mother. Jesus was not conceived by in vitro fertilization. He was conceived in the womb of this virgin girl by the name of Mary. According to the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1, one of our favorite texts, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God and then down in verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth now we may ask what does it mean to say that the word was made flesh perhaps you and I could debate what does it mean to be made flesh but I believe that the best commentator or interpreter of what he means by the words made flesh are John himself who addressed this same issue in 1st John chapter 1 verse 1 now we just read from the gospel of John chapter 1 but please look at 1st John chapter 1 beginning at verse 1 same subject same author, same words, and same terms. But here we receive some additional insight as to what is meant by the idea of the word being made flesh. Here's what John says in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Same terminology used by Paul in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. When Paul said word or the Greek logos, he was not using that in the sense it was used in Greek philosophy in the first century. His background was not Greek philosophy, but Hebrew theology. And when he says word, he does not mean some kind of an impersonal principle that is in control of the universe. But when he says word, his background is the fact that in the Old Testament, God, identif God has identified himself as the Word and as the voice of the Lord. But when John addresses this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, he further identifies the Word of the Lagos as the Word of life. And he says that the life was manifested. And we have shown you that eternal life which was with the Father. Just as John 1.1 1, 1 says the Word was with God. Which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Just as John 1.14 says the Word was made flesh. In other words when John says made flesh he means manifested in the flesh. He means the same thing that Paul means when he says God was manifest in the flesh. 
Acts chapter 1 verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was inspired by the Holy Spirit as were so many others at other times in the New Testament to identify Mary as the mother of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, in fact, I thought about titling this message today something like the humanity of Christ is a Pentecostal message because it certainly is. It's found very richly interwoven in Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 25, please turn there and take a look at an extended text with me here down through verse 31. Peter says, For David speaketh concerning him. Now at this point we must notice that David is that Peter is quoting from Psalm 16 verses 8 through 11. And uh, Peter says that David in this psalm is speaking concerning Christ. Now we'll notice this very clearly in a moment. But let me just say right now that what this means is that David in this psalm is not talking about himself. He is speaking concerning the Messiah. And he's quoting the Messiah in this prophetic psalm. And here is what the Messiah says. Notice the words. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Now notice the Messiah is still speaking in prophecy. He says, moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One, that's the Messiah, to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now that's the end of the quote from the Messiah in the psalm. Then Peter goes on to say, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, David was a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This was a messianic prophecy that is very clear about the fact that the Messiah would be a human Messiah. He would have flesh. He would have a soul. His flesh would rest in hope. Why would his flesh rest in hope? Because he has incorruptible flesh? Oh no, that's not it. His flesh would rest in hope not because it was incorruptible or not subject to decay, but because he knew he would be raised from the dead. It was the resurrection from the grave that spared him the corruption that would otherwise have occurred. He was raised from the dead by the resurrection and spared that corruption that would have transpired. In Psalm 132 verse 11, which Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost, the Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body I will set upon thy throne. In other words, the Messiah would actually be descended physically from David. He would be the fruit of David's body. Now the amazing thing to me about this text from Psalm 16 is that Peter is not the only one who uses this in the book of Acts. Paul also quoted from the same psalm and made the same point in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. And we read here, Acts 13, 22, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now verse 23, Of this man's seed, that is of David's seed, hath God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior 
Jesus. Verse 33 of Acts 13. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. A reference to the Davidic covenant. Verse 35. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, and this is Psalm 16 again, that thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Now the point in both of these texts, Peter on the day of Pentecost and Paul in Acts 13, is that Jesus avoided corruption by being raised from the dead. The reason he avoided corruption in that way is because he had a human body. He had a human existence that otherwise would have corrupted. David did corrupt. David is dead and buried. Both of these men make this point. David is not talking about himself here. He's dead. He's buried. His body is corrupted. But the one of whom Psalm 16 is speaking did not see corruption because he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. I do want to point out that in all of these texts where it mentions the seed of David, the Greek word is sperma or spermatos from which we get, of course, the English sperm. This word seed indicates the genetic biological connection between David and Jesus. Paul was not finished in Acts 13. He goes on in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, to write these words, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In that verse we have two very clear words that indicate the biological connection between David and Christ. And those words are seed, sperma, and flesh, sarks, of his seed according to the flesh. Romans chapter 9, verse 5, Paul says it again, whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. The meaning there is that Jesus received his flesh or his human existence from his ancestors, from the patriarchs in the nation of Israel. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, now to Abraham, and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Matthew told us in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. The angel Gabriel told Mary that David was his father. Paul writes in Galatians 3.16 that the seed of Abraham is Christ. In other words, the descendant of Abraham. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul writes again, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. In other words, the son, the Greek preposition here, means the son is made out of or from the woman. She contributed something to him. He was made of her. And also he is made under the law. Now please note there are two different prepositions in this verse. And one preposition is related to Jesus' relationship with the woman. The other preposition is related to Jesus' relationship with the law. It would be a mistake to think that if he was made out of a woman, he was also made out of the law. Jesus' relationship with the woman is governed by one preposition, ek. And that preposition means he was made from the woman. His relationship with the law is governed by another preposition, hupa. And that preposition means that the law was in effect when he came. But this verse says that the son was made of a woman. Philippians chapter 2 Verse 7 reads, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now this word translated likeness, which is the Greek homoio mati, it's a likeness of humanity referring to a genuine likeness, not to the phantom humanity of docetism. Though homoio mati is a reference to the external appearance, it does not inherently exclude internal reality. In other words, he is a man 
but he is more than a man. As Chrysostom said, we are soul and body, but he, that is Jesus, is God and soul and body. In this case, the emphasis is simply on what was visible to those who observed Jesus in his incarnation. They could not see within him to behold his complete human nature. Nevertheless, they could observe from external appearance that he was a man. And then, of course, one of our favorite texts, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now, I would like to point out that, as you know, there are some translations, if you read them, that will say here, not God was manifest in the flesh, but something like who was manifest in the flesh. Even in that case, it's clear it's talking about Christ. But I do want to say that as far as the Greek text is concerned, now there's a little handful, there's four or five manuscripts that read something other than God was manifest in the flesh. But as far as the majority text is concerned, 85 to 90%, of the Greek texts that have the book of 1 Timothy in them. As far as the church fathers are concerned, in the way they quoted this scripture in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, and far as the early translations are concerned, which mean, began to be made within 50 years after the death of the Apostle John, and as far as the lexicons are concerned, all of these testify that the reading of 1 Timothy 3.16 is God was manifest in the flesh. He that was manifest in the flesh was God himself, but please notice he was was manifest in the flesh or in genuine human existence. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, quoting from Psalm 45, verse 7, reads, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, now this is from a messianic prophecy in Psalm 45, 7, therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Who are these fellows of the Messiah? They're not angels because Hebrews chapter 1 points out that the Messiah is better than the angels and superior to the angels. Jesus is not an angel. He's not a created angel or Michael or somebody who came to this earth. The fellows of the Messiah in Hebrews chapter 1 are not angels, but they are human beings. This word that is translated fellows indicates that Jesus shares in and partakes of humanity with us. As it pertains to his human existence, we are his peers or his fellows. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 7, quoting from Psalm 8, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set over him the works of thy hands. Verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. According to Psalm 8 where this is all quoted from, this is a reference to the genuine humanity of Jesus Christ. In fact in Psalm 8 verse 4 there's actually a reference to the Son of Man when it says what is man that thou art mindful of him. That's a reference to human beings in general but it goes on to say and the Son of Man that thou visitest him. And according to the writer of Hebrews who wrote under inspiration that Son of Man is a reference to Jesus Christ himself, and thus we have another testimony to the genuineness of his humanity. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews is full of this. For both he that sanctifieth and those who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare, this is from Psalm 22, 22, another messianic psalm, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Verse 14 of Hebrews 2, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things 
it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. We have a purpose clause here. That purpose clause tells us the reason he was made like his brethren in all things is in order that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus' high priesthood depends upon the fact that he stands in solidarity with us, having been made like us in all things that are essential to human nature. A high priest must be one of those that he represents to God. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 gives us tremendous insight as to the prayers of Jesus. Hebrews 5, 7 reads, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Jesus' prayers indicate the genuineness of his human nature. They were real prayers that were offered unto God and they were heard according to Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7. His prayers were not just to give us an example about praying. They certainly do that. But Jesus prayed because he needed to pray. Because he stands with us in our human existence. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. That is not the tribe of Levi of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. The priesthood and the royal throne were always kept separate in Israel. But in Christ Jesus, the throne and the priesthood are united together because he is the king in the lineage of David and he is a priest forever according not to the order of Levi but according to the order of Melchizedek. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. A very pertinent text. John writes in 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. The point that John is making here is that a denial of the incarnation is Antichrist. Or in other words, anti-Messiah. Christos, Messiah, same meaning. Because by definition, the Messiah is God incarnate. And so if we deny that he came in the flesh, we are denying that he he is truly the Messiah that was prophesied for us in the Hebrew Scriptures. First John, by the way, was written to oppose docetism, apparently, which was an incipient form of Gnosticism that denied the reality of Christ's humanity. The docetists taught that Jesus' humanity was only an appearance. That's from the Greek word dake, which means to seem. They taught his humanity was just an appearance, and that if you tried to pat Jesus on the back, your hand would pass right through him. On the other hand, on the contrary, John says, our hands have handled him. We have seen him. We know him. The word of life which is manifest in the flesh. In fact John was not finished with it there in 2nd John chapter 1 verse 7. This is apparently burning an inspired hole in his soul. 2nd John chapter 1 verse 7 John wrote for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Going to the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 5 John wrote, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The word that is translated root, the Greek word hridza, indicates the genetic and biological connection between Jesus and David. It describes anything that grows from a root like one stem. And then finally, in the last chapter of the entire Bible, Jesus himself declares the genuineness of his human nature. In Revelation 22:16, Jesus says, I 
Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. As far as I'm concerned, that's the final word. If that's the only verse I had, if Jesus says to me, I'm the root and the offspring of David, I believe that. In fact, the root, as I already mentioned, indicates genetic relationship, but so does the word offspring, genos, which indicates that biological relationship and confirms that Jesus received his human nature from David. Now, we've just done a very quick survey, as you've seen, of a few verses in the New Testament concerning the humanity of Christ. These are verses that directly declare his human nature. Now I'd like to spend just a few moments looking at some of the messianic prophecies, our second category of scripture. For this, we go all the way back to the book of Genesis. If you would turn there with me, please. Genesis chapter three. After the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, the consequences of that fall include a series of curses. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God said to the serpent, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, now that would better be translated as most modern translations will render it, he. The, the, prep, the pronoun there is actually he. But it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his, and there the pronoun is found, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now as you look at this verse very carefully, there's three phrases here. In the first phrase, there is enmity between the serpent and the woman. Now we could talk about that, and that's important, but that's not really all that pertinent to what we're saying right here, right now. There is enmity between the serpent and the woman. In the second phrase, there is enmity between the serpent's seed. The word means offspring. And the woman's seed. That also means offspring. Same word. Again, that's an important phrase. That's an inspired scripture, but that's not a part of what we're talking about here right now. We long ago rejected strange doctrines concerning the serpent seed doctrine, but that's, we don't need to take up time with that. What we need to notice here today is the third phrase, where the focus is not on the enmity between the serpent and the woman, or not even on enmity between the serpent seed and her seed, but in the third phrase, the focus is on a specific singular offspring of the woman who according to the Hebrew pronoun here is a male who will bruise the head of the serpent himself. Now notice, not the head of the serpent's seed, but the head of the serpent himself and whose heel will be bruised by the serpent himself, not by the serpent's seed. Now again, in the first phrase, the enmity is between the serpent and the woman. In the second phrase, it's between the serpent's seed and her seed. But in the third phrase, the enmity is between a specific male offspring of the woman and between the serpent himself. In other words, the final consequences of the serpent's deception in Genesis 3 is that he will be destroyed by a male descendant of Eve, a male descendant whose heel the serpent will bruise. Who could this be but Jesus? As we read in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews 2, 14. Also, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The seed of the woman who crushed the head of the serpent is Jesus Christ who descended from Eve but brought redemption to her through the miracle of the incarnation. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. Uh, God said to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now Paul, under the inspiration of Scripture, referred to this in Galatians 3.16, and said, Now to Abraham 
and his seed where the promise is made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. In other words, it is the seed of Abraham, Christ Jesus, through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed as they hear the gospel of Christ and come to faith in him. Genesis chapter 49 verse 10, Jacob is on his deathbed. He's uttering his last statements to his 12 sons. And when he gets down to Judah, Jacob says in Genesis 49 verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foe unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Any question who this is talking about? No, this is talking about Jesus Christ. I want you to notice uh, two points here. First of all, the word that is transliterated here, Shiloh, is is a word that means he to whom it belongs. The idea is the scepter, the, the throne, the ruling authority will not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until the one comes, he who comes to whom it belongs. And as we saw, of course, in Hebrews 7, 13, he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, uh, which no man gave attendance of the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. I also like you to notice that the scepter would not depart from this tribe of Judah, nor this phrase, a lawgiver from between his feet, which is a Hebraism for the fact that this Shiloh, this one to whom it belonged, would be one who would actually spring physically from the tribe of Judah. As the book of Hebrews said, our Lord sprang out of Judah a precise fulfillment. We've already talked about Psalm 16. This is a prophecy, but we talked about it when we were going through the book of Acts chapter 2 and chapter 13. It is Psalm 16, 9. I won't read the entire text again, but it's a messianic psalm according to both Peter and Paul. And it reads, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Please remember, this was not David talking about himself. Because as Peter and Paul said, David is dead and buried. He is corrupted. His sepulcher is with us to this day. But he was talking about the Messiah who was not left in hell. Neither did his soul see corruption. Psalm 132 verse 11 to which we have already alluded. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Now in the Old Testament there are some covenants that are conditional. God says I will do this if you will do that. There are some covenants that are unconditional. Where God says I'm going to do this. I don't care what you do. There are, there's one covenant at least that both has conditional and unconditional elements. But when it comes to this right here this is an unconditional statement. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David he will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body I will set upon thy throne and Peter says in Acts 2 30 therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne now of course our much beloved Isaiah 7 14 therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Notice the prophet said, a virgin shall conceive. Matthew chapter 1 verse 22. This is written. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, meaning Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. In the miracle of the incarnation he is God with us but he is also conceived in the womb of a virgin and thus shares with us in our human existence. Now I'd like to move to the last of these three categories and that is the category of deduction. Much more could be said here, but I would like to make a few comments. We know from Scripture, Philippians 3.21 to be precise, that at the rapture, our bodies will be transformed to be like His glorious body. Philippians 3.21 reads, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned 
like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself now we also know from 1 Corinthians 15 53 that this change will involve corruption which is the ability to decay putting on incorruption or the inability to decay and mortality which is the ability to die putting on immortality meaning the inability to die we know this from 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 53 where Paul wrote for this corruptible able to decay must put on incorruption unable to decay and this mortal able to die must put on immortality in other words inability to die now here's the deduction that we draw from this proposition one we will be changed into a body like Jesus now has that's Philippians 321 proposition 2 we will be changed into an incorruptible immortal body we know that from 1st Corinthians 15 53 the conclusion is Jesus has an incorruptible immortal body at this point this means that before his resurrection Jesus had a corruptible mortal body like we now have if this is not true this means that Jesus always had a body that was incorruptible unable to decay and immortal unable to die and this would contradict the scriptures that declare both the, cor the corruptibility of his body that we've already looked at and also his death on the cross in other words in the final analysis any teaching that denies Jesus humanity before his resurrection was like our humanity ultimately denies his death and the atonement itself Another deduction, 1 Corinthians 15, 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beast, another of fishes, and another of birds. Here's the deduction, proposition one. There is one kind of flesh of men. Notice that, not two kinds, not more than one kind. There's one kind of flesh of men. Proposition two, Jesus was a man. He's identified in scripture as a man. He's identified as the son of man, being a descendant of men. Therefore, the conclusion is Jesus had the same kind of flesh as all men. If there's only one flesh, if Jesus was a man, he had human flesh. An interesting point that may at first be somewhat confusing to us is that the Hebrew Zerah and the Greek Sperma are used in Scripture. Now, you and I probably wouldn't use it this way today in North America in the 21st century. But in Scripture, these words are used of both men and women to designate their offspring. In the language of the Bible, a woman's descendant is her seed, her offspring connected biologically with her by means of the egg. Now, here's a series of conclusions that I would like to draw from the Scriptures we've examined. The only way Jesus differed from us in his humanity is that he did not possess the sin nature. By the miracle of the virgin birth and by the fact that he was begotten by the Holy Spirit, he was spared the sin nature. That which was born of Mary is called by the angel that holy thing. But this does not make Jesus any less human than us or any different in his humanity than us because the sin nature is not inherent to human nature both Adam and Eve were complete human beings before they sin and thus before they possess the sin nature the sin nature that you and I now have is actually a mar on human nature Jesus did not have that mar on his human nature but he was truly and fully human some may question how Jesus could have possessed a genuine human nature if he had no human father but remember Adam had no human father and he was a genuine human being for that matter neither did Eve have a human father but she was a genuine human being Jesus had a human mother and therefore he must be a genuine and complete human being his deity was contributed by the Holy Spirit now how this could be is a mystery because it is a miracle and the human mind cannot explain any miracle much 
much less the greatest miracle ever to occur. We accept by faith what Scripture says about Jesus. He is God and He is man. When we've exhausted everything we can say about Him, we leave the rest to God. It is the privilege of the sovereign Lord to do what He wishes to do without consulting with or explaining it to us. It's a miracle. God is the one who works miracles. I always regret just a little bit every year, not really, but a little bit I regret removing from freshmen at Christian Life College one of their favorite points of discussion. I know it was a favorite point when I was a student in Bible College nearly 40 years ago. And that was how could Jesus be truly human and have human blood if he didn't have a human father? And so we used to sit around and debate, and they still do. Did he have divine blood? Whatever that would mean. But see, what we've overlooked is that Mary had her own questions about how she could give birth to a human son without the participation of a human father. The Bible says in Luke 1.34, Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now let me tell you, Gabriel's answer to Mary, and Gabriel was a spokesman for God that day. He was a messenger from God on a divine mission. And Gabriel's answer to Mary should be sufficient for you and me. He said, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. It may seem impossible to us that Mary could conceive without a human husband, but with God, nothing shall be impossible. It may seem impossible to us that Mary could actually contribute the human nature to Jesus without Jesus sharing in the sin nature. But remember, with God, nothing shall be impossible. It may seem impossible to us that Jesus could have been fully human without a human father. But remember, with God, nothing is impossible. It may seem impossible to us that Jesus could be fully God and fully man in one integrated person. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. To deny that these things are possible is to say there is something that is impossible with God and that is specifically denied in this text. If Christ were anything other than truly human, we would have no intercessor, no kinsman redeemer, no high priest, and ultimately no atonement. I pray that the United Pentecostal Church International will always boldly proclaim with the apostles that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And I pray that we will always agree with Jesus that he is the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. In these two truths, we find the balance of truth concerning the identity and the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands and thank the Lord today for the wonderful truth of Scripture he has given us. Hallelujah. Lord, I rejoice in you today and acknowledge that you are my Redeemer and Savior. Acknowledge that you came among us and stood in solidarity with us and that you came humbling yourself, taking the form of a man. Hallelujah. Thank you for the redemption that you have brought through the manifestation of God in flesh. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I want you to know you heard something today. Is this on your book? The book is here to be bought. Now all that he said is not in the book, but a good deal of it is in the book. He just added a ton more to it. And I tell you what, he said it so fast that if you didn't have a fast brain, you were lost. <laughs> I sat there trying to keep up with him in the scriptures and then I thought he's got a book and we'll get that book and read it and if you hear me preaching about the fact that God is in the flesh when he came through Jesus Christ I got it in the book Thank you, I think he describes something here today that's very vital to us and I want to I want to really impress you with it this is not defined flesh Jesus did not have divine flesh. His ex explanation about the sin nature was excellent because of the fact that though he was human, he was God in form of man. 
he could not be God in form of man if he had sinful flesh. Right, right, absolutely. You understand? Right. <clears throat> Turn around to somebody and say, I understand, but I'm having a rough time understanding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we could encourage all of these men to get this video and take it home and play it to their young ministers. It would. <laughs> well, it's available. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> I don't know how you feel about video. Some don't feel about it. <clears throat> Some are opposed to it. But this is a holy video that was made today. It is on video if you want to get it. And it's a holy video. And if it's not in your mind a holy video, bring it up to us and we'll sanctify it. We'll lay hands on it and we'll make it a holy video. I think this man deserves a lot of applause Thank here today you. for us. If I could spit out preaching like that, man alive, my messages would be unusually short. I'll never forget what a woman told me. She had come to the altar and I'd preached that night. She had, I knew her in her former life. She had been a very sinful woman. And I, we, we considered it a victory that she came to the altar. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, what was it I said that brought you to the altar? She said, nothing you said. That put me right back where I belonged. And then she said, you preached so long, I thought I would never get the chance to go to the altar. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but you all done the same thing. But isn't it great that the Word of God has its way in the hearts of men? You don't have to be afraid of your doctrine, my friend. Don't be afraid of your doctrine. Don't let other folks make you afraid of it. You've got a solid rock upon which you can stand. And all hell cannot prevail against it. The Jesus I serve was a living human being. And now he's a glorified holy God of all mankind the great beauty of all of this that God thought in his thinking that the only way he could save us was to come amongst us and when he came amongst us with the same kind of flesh he let the world know there is a power that can save to the uttermost and then he also let the whole world know when he became a glorified Christ that you and I could receive what he gave to us through the Holy Spirit. Now I am with you, but then I shall be in you. And the spirit you have in you is the spirit of the living God. And that spirit of the living God is a motivating factor in our victory over sin. He who overcame sin lives within us. Oh, we ought to praise God for that. Give him glory for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing us with your divine presence. And we'll give you the honor for it. Let me ask Brother Seagraves to come back here a minute, if he would, please. Now, some of you might, we have a little time here which is unusual for conference to have a little time if you would like to ask him a question we're going to open the microphones for you to ask that question so that anything you might have misunderstood he can clear up in your thinking so you may be seated and he'll be here for a few minutes we have a few minutes and uh, brother Ch brother chairman yes where are you right here I, I know, I know, I know you right here, but I know. Brother Harden. There you go. First of, first of all, I'd like to commend Brother Seagraves for this very excellent and scholarly presentation today. 
and I say it to my own shame, I can't do it that well. But I heard Brother Cox last night talk about uh, members of other denominations in his city that were leaning in this direction. And while Brother Seagraves was speaking, I thought what an excellent tool this could be if this tape could be given to a minister of another denomination with maybe just the words, listen to this and see what you think of it. And I have one man who is a friend in my city, member of the Presbyterian Church, a good man, a praying man, that I think would receive a tape like this. The tapes will be available. All right, sir. Sure. Praise the Lord. Um, Brother Seagraves, could you deal for a moment with the whole idea of the kinsman redeemer? Goel kinsman. Hear what you say, kinsman redeemer. That's a very excellent question. Thank you for that question, and I really do appreciate these things that have been said here today. Um, well, briefly, it seems that in the Old Testament, the concept of the kinsman redeemer is one of those areas that prophetically points to the Messiah. Uh, the whole concept of redemption is bound up in the Hebrew word there, Gaol. And um, I think what I would like to say, maybe in a broader sense, of course I'm, I'm not prepared to give a lot of detail about that, but I'd like to say in a broader sense that I believe that we need to read the Old Testament with a focus on Jesus Christ as the central message of the Old Testament. Now I know that we probably all of us would say that we do this and I would say that I've done this for years but really only recently have I begun to see uh, how dramatic the focus is on Jesus Christ our Messiah throughout the pages of the Old Testament. Jesus said all things must be fulfilled which were written in the prophets in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me I think all of us we're talking about tapes here today all of us would love to have a tape of the lesson that Jesus taught the disciples on the Emmaus Road after his resurrection when he opened their understanding to the scriptures and those things concerning him, of course, that's a reference to the Hebrew scriptures at that point in time. I'd give anything for a tape of that lesson. I know you would too. But really all we can do is prayerfully study both the New Testament and the Old Testament and specifically see where does the New Testament quote from the Old Testament, which, is do which it does in probably at least 400 different places. With many of those quotations being directly from the Old Testament and applied to the Messiah. And so, um, I believe that there is a very rich stream of messianic prophecy in the Old Testament that remains to be mined. Uh, just as far as my own personal experience is concerned, I started about, um, probably about 40 weeks ago, teaching verse by verse through the book of Psalms. Now, as you can tell, I've got a job ahead of me. That's a big book. I'm in chapter, uh, not chapter, but in Psalm 32. And it has just been incredible to me to focus on that with the, I, asking myself the question, could this be about Jesus? 